I would like to introduce you to Dr. Leonardo Leo Lusgarden. And he actually, um, this is really interesting. He is originally from Caracas, Venezuela. He completed his residency in Venezuela and then he trained further as a neurosurgeon at the Radcliffe Infirmary of University of Oxford, UK. And he also has a visiting academic at the Neurological Institute of New York at Columbia Presbyterian. He, for over 20 years in Venezuela as a neurosurgeon and radio surgeon, Dr. Lusgarden performs surgeries on brain tumors, both in adult and pediatric patients, as well as stereostatic procedures. He is now the US Director for Neural Oncology and Global Clinical Lead for Glioblastoma Clinical Trials with Novacure. Leo, are you there? I am. I am indeed, Dylan. Can you oh, can you see? Hi. Me? We can see you. Nice to see you. Can you hear me as well? We can, can hear you. you. I've, I've been here all the time, just in the shadows. And oh, um, fabulous, fabulous. Yes. And um, both uh, Danny and Yvonne and Dr. Sane basically made my presentation very easy because they they already covered most of what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> but anyhow, we will we will get into some of the details because this presentation is for all of you. So. As you mentioned, I've devoted all of my life to brain tumor patients. That has been my passion um, to be in the patient's journey, the way, not only the way I trained, but the way I worked in, in Venezuela for over 22 years is that the man with the knife is always the head of the orchestra and patients, even though patients would be receiving chemotherapy and radiotherapy, they would always come back to the neurosurgeon for guidance and, and for advice. So. Uh, I've been involved in this patient's journey, you know, since the moment patients are diagnosed until, you know, uh, the last moments um, I've, I've been there. So I've, I've seen it, I've done it, and I've been there. So I, I um, that, therefore, I'm actually very privileged to be here. It's a real honor. Um, Del and I presume I can share my screen, correct? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Um, just want to make sure that you can see the presentation. I can see it. How about everyone else? We can see it. Okay. So I, I will, um, even though I might touch a few points that have been discussed before, I will give you um, some um, real life explanations as to why we do what we do. And we'll, we'll get into a few details of uh, tumor treating fields because it's a really innovative type of treatment as um, Yvonne and, and Dennis were mentioning before. And therefore, I wanted to start with this slide. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. So I'll, I'll make a huge effort in trying to explain something that might seem very complicated, but at the end, you will, you will find that it's uh, actually rather simple. I, oh, sorry about this. Um, Sorry about that. I, um, if you allow me just for a second, it had some. Um... There we go. I hope I erased that. Okay. Can you see the presentation again? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry about that. So um, I, I, I basically, I always like to start with this slide every time I've been giving these presentations on brain tumors because this is a reminder of, of our mission here as neurosurgeons and neuro-oncologists. And this, if you actually notice the date of this um, magazine cover, this was the Sunday Times, 1997. I was uh, doing my training uh, at the time and in, in the UK. This, this came with the newspaper, and so you can imagine how old this is, um, every Sunday. And I was really impacted by this cover. I photographed it and I've used it for over 25 years in all of my presentations, because it's a reminder that we need to find a cure. Someday we will, but this is a reminder because this is the way we're born as babies. And as, as you know, as the cover is saying, one, one of us will get cancer when we grow up. So, because this um, entire meeting is called Know Your Options, I will go briefly, and um, Dr. Sanai already mentioned some of them, but I want to give you some details as to what, um, 
to make sense of, of our standard of care options. And he was very clear when he mentioned standard of care, so meaning that they have been proven already for decades. So this, this um, standard of care therapies and alternatives, they actually have stood the proof of time. So this is what neurosurgeons look like. And I do remember lots of patients, and this is the first pillar for a brain tumor is surgery. This is what neurosurgeons look like, look like in the operating room. And many patients used to ask me, well, doctor, but I mean, if the prognosis of these tumors is so bad, what's the point in having surgery? Well, um, the rationale behind it is that, remember, these tumors are causing mass effect. The mass effect causes neurological symptoms and signs. It also causes something that we call edema, which is an inflammation surrounding the tumor, and that increases uh, intracranial pressure. So by removing as much as possible, um, we are basically removing this mass effect. We're reducing the edema. And we're also making those cells that we know we're leaving behind, those malignant cells that we cannot remove with surgery, we are making them somehow more sensitive for further therapies. And that's the reason why, apart from surgery, you will always see that the combo includes also radiotherapy, as Dr. Sané was mentioning. Um, the other important thing, this is what patients look like with the external um, radio, uh, radiotherapy, and this is fractionated, as Dr. Sané mentioned. And it's fractionated because we fractionate the entire dose. It, normally, it's 60 grays. And we give it between 1.8 to 2 grays per day from Monday to Friday. And then you will probably hear that the patients they have to rest over the week. And it's not that the radiation oncologist needs to rest, it's that the brain needs to rest before they can be hit again with another dose of radiotherapy continuously. And this goes on week after week for six weeks. Um, the patients need to be immobilized, as you know, um, for those of you who've been there. And the reason is because um, we wanna make sure that the radiation actually hits the tumor where it needs to go and not places where it shouldn't go because it can cause you know, any further damage. So this is our second standard of care therapy. This is our third standard of care therapy, but this is on purpose. This is kind of a very old um, picture and I did it on purpose. This is what chemotherapy looked like uh, a few decades ago when I, when I was doing my training. At that point when, uh, uh, like Dr. Sané mentioned, we, we had just a few chemotherapeutic options like the nitrogen mustards, and they were causing lots of effects. So patients needed to be in the hospital for a few days just to treat and deal with side effects. Well, as you all know, 2005 came along and there was a huge landmark article um, published by Roger Stubb, a neuro-oncologist and his group. It was a multi-center study. And this is, in a way, it was a revolutionary study because it changed the way um, everyone in the neuro-oncology field would feel about giving chemotherapy to patients. As you know, um, temozolomide or temodar is givenly, it's, it's given orally, so it's very comfortable, it's very easy to take, it usually causes very low side effects. And the other important thing is that they actually achieve a benefit in overall survival. So this is why, even though before chemotherapy was not very effective, the introduction of chemotherapy became part of the standard of care. And it became part of the standard of care because it was combined with radiotherapy. So this is what we call chemo radiation. So patients would receive radiotherapy and temozolomide combined for six weeks. And then the patients would have what we call a month break. And then they will start what we call maintenance um, chemotherapy with temozolomide. So as you know, it's given the first five days of every cycle for six cycles. This is what Roger Stubb actually um, came with and it became a landmark story. You've, you've heard from uh, Dennis and Yvonne, you've heard their story about their journey. I've already in a nutshell mentioned uh, very briefly, you know, what's the patient's journey. So, you know, patients need to go through surgery. They have to go through radiotherapy and chemotherapy. But I will tell you, and, and again, I'm missing the fourth pillar, which is the one I will talk about in the next uh, upcoming slide. But I wanted to mention before we get into that, just what the industry and pharma journey has been. So 
if you look at this, and I would like to take you from the left to the right, you will see in the 1970s, there was nothing really that much um, available. Then in the 1970s, 1997, sorry, 1977, 1976, Carmostin and Lomostin were FDA approved. So these were kind of the first chemotherapeutic drugs approved for glioblastomas. So we're talking about the 1970s. Then two decades passed before something else was approved. That is just incredible, two decades before Carmostin, which is again, it's the same chemotherapy. It was just uh, gliadel wafers. They were just wafers impregnated with chemotherapy delivered in the surgical bed. Um, so two decades before that could actually somehow change something. The next uh, improvement was the same Carmostin, but for newly diagnosed patients. And then, as I mentioned, uh, almost three decades later, 2005, Temosolomide came along. Um, and then we have 2011 and 2015, we have this new um, and what I call the fourth modality of treatment because it's the only medical device you've probably heard of radiotherapy, chemotherapy, surgery, but this is something completely um, a breakthrough. It's the only medical device approved for the delivery of tumor treating fields, which is a different mechanism of action and we'll get into that. But what I wanted to show you is, unfortunately, how slow we have been moving forward with new discoveries. So just to give you an idea that it's, it, it hasn't been easy at all. So getting into our subject matter, what are tumor treating fields? You've probably heard them. You, you saw uh, Dennis wearing the arrays. So basically, tumor treating fields are alternating electrical fields that are finely tuned to specific frequencies. So we, we actually talk, talk about low intensity intermediate frequency, which is basically 200 kilohertz, and I'll get into that. But what it does, it interferes with a biological process called mitosis. And for those of you who don't know, mitosis is basically the biological process with which the cells in the body divide. So not only tumor cells, all cells divide through a process called mitosis, the difference is that tumors have a very high mitotic index, meaning that they divide more frequently and more rapidly than normal cells and without any type of control. That's what makes a tumor aggressive when, when they have this kind of characteristics. So tumor treating fields, as you can see, it's basically delivered through two pairs of arrays. And the reason for the two pairs of arrays is that because we don't know, we know that the tumor cells are dividing continuously, but we know we don't know their spatial orientation or the timing when they will be dividing because we suppose they do it all the time. Then with two pairs of arrays, we can actually make sure that we will somehow impact or hit many, many more cells than by just delivering it in one direction. A couple of things that um, are important. So this is a local regional therapy. So it's delivered locally, uh, regionally. It has no systemic side effects. And basically the only side effect that we can um, mention and um, Dennis mentioned it is basically dermatitis. It causes some um, skin adverse events. In the vast majority of cases, it's grade one and grade two. So they are very easy to manage with topical ointments. Um, very rarely they reach uh, grade three or four. A again, it's very rare. And the other important thing that I wanted to mention is that this is um, tumor treating fields is um, FDA approved and C marked for adults with newly diagnosed glioblastoma patients concurrently with temosolomide and recurrent glioblastomas. And it also got a uh, humanitarian device exemption for malignant uh, pleural mesothelioma. So as you can see, uh, tumor treating fields is basically not for easy tumors. Basically, these are very nasty tumors uh, and very aggressive. Um, you already saw um, Dennis, and Dennis, please, my apologies for uh, referring to you all the time, but this is great. So you can actually see what patients look like. They can lead a very reasonable, normal life, um, as Dennis was mentioning. And now we'll get a little bit into the details as to how they work and what, why, uh, how they do their function. So again, you mentioned it's not electricity, it's electrical fields, but I wanna mention something that is very important. What you're seeing here on the left is a cell 
okay? And the cell has what we call a cell cycle in, you know, within their division time. So this is a normal cell. As you can see in the midline, you will see this axis. These are the chromosomes. So before a cell divides, these chromosomes will, half of these chromosomes will have to go half to each eventual daughter cell, right? Because remember, this cell will divide into two daughter cells. But tumor treating fields is based on the fact that most organelles that are inside of the cell are electrically charged. So we have a, a few very important molecules called tubulins. These are these uh, dark uh, little lines inside. So what will happen is that the tubulins will normally form kind of a net and this net will attach the chromosomes and they will drag um, half of the chromosomes to each side. This is what would normally happen in a normal cell, but because we are applying tumor treating fields to this cell, these tubulins that are dipoles, they are very electrically charged. They will align with the electrical fields and they will not form this net. So the chromosomes will not be dragged to each side. The cell will enter something that we call mitotic arrest and the cell will die. So that's, that's simply explained. So again, because you need this net, which is called microtubule spindle, this net will drag these chromosomes to each daughter cell, but because this is not happening, because these molecules are aligning with the electrical fields, then these cells end up dying in a process that we call apoptosis. But we know this is what we call the dipole alignment, but we also know that some cells will escape that part and they will continue their normal cycle and they will uh, reach the, um, the one here, which looks like an eight or an hourglass shape. So what will happen here is that the electrical fields will form what we call a non-uniform electrical field. I don't want to confuse you with terms, but what you need to know is that the intensity of the electrical fields here in the midline is so strong that it kind of drags all of the organelles and chromosomes into the midline. The cell will divide, but it will divide so abnormally and it will die as well. So those are the two major mechanisms um, as to how tumor treating fields uh, work and, and uh, creates this, what we call anti-mitotic effect. So it basically disrupts this normal biological process. A couple of other things that I would like to mention is uh, this is what we normally have when you're uh, giving um, systemic therapy, so drugs. As you can see, once you start an infusion of a drug, the drug will sort of reach a peak and then it will start decreasing until you give another bolus of this drug and so on. With radiotherapy, something very similar happens. So every day that you're receiving radiotherapy, you will have this high dose, but then when you're not receiving radiotherapy, nothing's happening. Uh, with tumor treating fields, the patient in a way controls the treatment because once you have these arrays on, and one important thing I wanna mention, these arrays are displayed and placed very specifically to where the tumor location is. So you will see that patients that have a frontal lobe tumor, the arrays will be somehow shifted a little bit more towards the frontal end, or if it's another area, you will see that the arrays are shifted in another direction. But the important thing, uh, as Dennis was mentioning, this is not a drug, so it does not have a half-life. So it only works as long as the device is on. So the patient can control actually when he or she wants to stop treatment or have uh, treatment breaks. We know from all of our previous studies, we recommend patients to stay on treatment at least 18 hours per day because we know that the best benefit will continue happening after that. Uh, we know that there is benefit after 12 hours, but we know that there is a significant uh, benefit in overall survival after um, those 18 hours. This is, again, I don't wanna confuse you, but just to give you an idea, we know, I've only explained the mechanism of action, the anti-mitotic uh, uh, anti effect, but I wanna tell you that tumor treating fields has been shown in preclinical in vitro and in vivo studies that has lots of, oops, sorry, um, my apologies. It has lots of other um, mechanisms of action. So this is really important because we are looking at different avenues for research. So we know that we can combine this probably with immune checkpoint inhibitors. We know that tumor treating fields causes um, problems in the migration and invasion of, of glial cells. 
We know that it induces autophagy. We know that it increases the cell membrane permeability. So that might be an avenue for research for increasing the dose of medications in the tumor. And also very importantly, and um, we know that it also affects the DNA repair capacity of these cells. And this is really important because as you will see, this is the rational of a clinical trial that we're conducting. Uh, I'll talk to you about um, in a second. So we, we still know, uh, as has been previously mentioned, glioblastomas are unfortunately still an unmet medical need. We have many hurdles. Um, we know we have something that you've probably heard, which is the blood-brain barrier. Uh, blood-brain barrier does not allow most of our drugs to get into the tumor and actually act on tumor. So that the molecules that can actually penetrate the blood-brain barrier, they have to be very small. Uh, molecules. Uh, there are not that many. Temosolomide is one of them, but that has been a hurdle for decades. We know that these tumors are extremely infiltrative in nature. So even if we do a, an MRI toilet, meaning that we removed everything that we saw in an MRI during surgery, we know that we're leaving malignant cells, microscopic, microscopic cells behind. And these are the cells that will eventually come back as a recurrence. And that's the reason why this, once you um, have your surgery, it usually needs to be complemented with both chemotherapy and radiotherapy to try to attack those cells. The other problem with these tumors is that they are very heterogeneous. So they have different hundreds of different cells of populations with different mutations. So you might have a portion of cells that respond to a certain treatment, but the others won't. So this makes this even uh, very difficult. And the other important thing that I wanna tell you is that these tumors are extremely, extremely intelligent. So they have found ways to escape immunosurveillance. So they have found ways to hide from our own immune system. And the other thing is that they have found ways um, also to destroy normal cells and, and uh, so, you know, all of these factors have become hurdles. This is why we need clinical trials, as Dr. Sine was mentioning. Clinical trials will provide us with the information that we will uh, essentially need to come up with uh, better information. And this brings me to one of my last slides, which is Trident. This is a uh, clinical trial that we're conducting. I was mentioning before the combination of radiotherapy with tumor treating fields. Well, you know, radiotherapy basically destroys the DNA of the cells, and that's the way, in, you know, in a nutshell, the way radiotherapy works. Well, usually these cells can actually repair DNA, but when we combine tumor treating fields with radiotherapy, we know that radiotherapy is destroying DNA, but tumor treating fields is um, avoiding the cells from normally repairing this DNA. So it's, it's kind of a synergistic effect and this is what we're actually evaluating in this clinical trial. Um, you have here a link if you're interested in uh, investigating about it. And um, just to um, finish, um, unfortunately, there is no miracle cure. You have to be very careful with what you read. There is a lot of information in internet, Google. Um, you have to read very serious publications. Not all clinical trials are um, scrutinize the way they should be. Unfortunately, not all of them work well, but still, you know, I would keep with the um, um, motto that you've heard before, never lose hope. Um, I, I learned some time ago, something that I have always kept in my mind, that not only you have to be knowledgeable, but you have to be an exceptional human being to treat patients with glioblastoma. So uh, there is a saying that I will repeat, maybe some of you have heard this before, but Patients don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Oh. And that has been, you know, one of the most impactful quotes that I've ever read in my life. Uh, the other thing that I want to tell you, never lose hope. Um, every neurosurgeon and every doctor in every specialty, we, when we provide the information to patients, we always have to base our information on statistics. And we tell them, well, 75% of patients do this, 85% of patients do that. And unfortunately, that's, that's our only strong piece of scientific argument. But all of us have anecdotes of patients that have actually bypassed these statistics. So never lose hope because you don't know if you are that you know, percentage of patients that will uh, do absolutely well. 
So with that, uh, I want to end this conversation. Knowledge is power. This is why we need clinical trials. We need knowledge and knowledge will help us, you know, bring cure to all of you. And I thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Lusgarden. That was very informative. Thank you. I like your energy behind it as well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. There we is a huge a passion behind this. I can tell, and thank you. I am, we have a question that came in. May I ask you that question? Of course. Okay, hang on, it just went away. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. My husband is on Optune currently. When will the new stronger arrays be available in the US? I see on Novacure corporate presentation that Europe will be getting them in 2022. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, I didn't know that. That's great. Um, so, <laughs> so um, um, uh, the question is great. So we we are our clinical research and development department. They are working strongly on many things. As you probably know, our first generation of Optune of tumor treating fields was a huge um, device. Uh, it weighed like three or four kilograms. It was really you know, a difficult device to carry. This new generation changed dramatically. It weighs only 1.2 kilograms, which is very simple and very light to carry. There's all sorts of packages, but not only the device we're working on, but also the arrays. So we're trying, we're, we've, and, and this is a continuous development with our engineers and physics, et cetera. So for this patient, yes, we are, we are um, I would say, close to probably coming up with a new design of, of arrays with maybe thinner ceramic discs and, and stronger delivery of the tumor treating fields, which will make things much easier for, for the patients. Oh, that's I amazing. hope that, yes, that's I amazing. hope that. Mm -hmm. So what year was it that um, tumor treating fields were FDA approved? Okay. so. Great question. So in 2011, it was originally approved for recurrent glioblastomas. In 2014, it was approved for newly diagnosed glioblastomas concurrently with temozolomide. There is something I wanted to mention. Um, I talked about uh, Roger Stoops article, the 2005 article. So I, I want to give you a, a piece of information here. Um, when he came up with this article, the overall survival improvement was only 2.5 months. And you know, you might say, wow, 2.5 months, that's nothing. Well, it is for a patient with a glioblastoma, it's it's basically 20, 25% of, of at that time, the average time. But um, when we, um, in our clinical trial, which is called EF14, when we combine tumor treating fields with temozolomide, and this is the study that actually granted us approval with, um, with the FDA, our overall survival improved to 4.9 months. So all, we almost doubled that. And, and, and wait, let me tell you, this is not even, this is from randomization. Uh, if you actually count the days from the date of surgery, it's another 3.8 months. So we're talking about almost nine months. That's, that's a huge amount of time. That's amazing, incredible. Um, does anyone else have any other questions for Dr. Lusgarden? You can either unmute yourself and ask, or you can type in the chat box your question. No? Okay. I want to thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Um, welcome to Novacure, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, and and I'm I'm very privileged with uh, this group. is is amazing. It's inspirational. I've worked with people like you all my life, and uh, what you're doing is is superb. So keep up the good work, keep up the hope, and again, always explore alternatives. And good luck to all of you. Oh, very you great messaging. Thank you.